Welcome to this class. This is a class on the sciences of the Qur'an. There's a text out there uh, called Erdem al-Qur'an uh, by a German scholar named von Denfer. I highly recommend um, that you obtain a copy of this text. Uh, it's not required, but highly, highly recommended. If you don't have it today, that's okay. So, uh, the text that, the, the seminal text in, in Ulum al-Qur'an, the sciences of the Qur'an, the most famous text is by Imam Jalaluddin al-Suyuti. This text is called Al-Itqan, Al-Itqan fi Ulum al-Qur'an which is uh, translated as the perfect guide to the sciences of the Qur'an. And it's been translated, uh, Hamid Algar and others. I think it's in two or three volumes, but it's quite robust. It's a little difficult to follow. So what von Denfer does with this text, Ulum uh, al-Qur'an, is he really tries to make a good abridgment of that text. That's easy to follow for students, for, uh, for students at, the be at the beginner's level. So he's done a service. Uh, for us in that regard. Uh, when, when we say sciences of the Qur'an, we're not talking about like geography in the Qur'an, biology, we're not talking about these, these natural sciences. We're talking about the word science um, uh, in Latin means a knowledge, knowledges or different aspects uh, related to the Qur'an. So, for example, today we're talking about uh, the concept of wahi, of revelation, right? So it's important to understand what is revelation, what is the nature of wahi. And then uh, our next meeting, we're going to be talking about, inshallah, the compilation of the Qur'an. When was it compiled? Um, how was it done? Who did it? What are the early uh, masahif or uh, codices, or manuscripts of the Qur'an? And then we also talk about things like Asbab al nuzul which is um, basically the historical contextualizations of many of the ayat of the Qur'an. So why was a certain verse revealed? What is the immediate cause of this ayat? Asbab al nuzul And then we talk about things like Nasq, or abrogation within the Qur'an. And this is something that is controversial, but most of the ulama say there are certain verses in the Qur'an that cancel other verses, right? So we'll talk about that, the extent of that, and why that's even in the Qur'an. <coughs> so today we're talking about wahi. And wahi, wahyun, wow, ha, ya, logatan, linguistically, right? So words have definitions, logatan, and fil istilah. Linguistically and technically. So, wahyun, linguistically, means to signify something quickly. To signify something. Wahyun. So, for example, if I do this, I've signified something. What have I, what have I signified? Peace. Peace. Good. So, it's immediate signifier of a concept or a meaning. Right? If I go like this, anyone? Hang loose. Hang ten? Is that what I was going to say hang loose. And this? Okay, or? Perfect. Huh? Perfect. Perfect. Or it's a, a satanic symbol as well. 666. Yeah, so you'll see people that are, and it's a real thing, the Church of Satan. It's headquartered out of San Francisco. It's one of their hands. There's another thing they do, but it's a, it's a curse. I'm not going to do it, but... So this is, this is the linguistic definition of wahi. To do something with your hands, or with your body, or with your eyes that signifies some sort of meaning quickly. And this is how it's used in the Quran. If you look at Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse 11, we are told, bukratan wa That Zakariya alayhi salam when he was given the Bushra, the good news of Yahya alayhi uh, salam, he took a vow of silence, which is something that they used to do in the previous uh, Umam. Uh, and when he came out of his sanctuary, فَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِمْ He gestured to them somehow, uh, signifying them or commanding them to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala morning and evening. Right? Now in the Qur'an, 
Auha, the verb auha, which is form four, a causative form, also means to teach or inspire or reveal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in Surah Nahal, verse 68, 1668, ila nahli jibali buyuta, that your Lord inspired the bees. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inspiring, is giving wahi to animals, to bees, to build houses uh, in the mountains. It also denotes satanic or demonic inspiration in the Quran. The same verb, awha, is used. So for example, you see like one eye symbolism everywhere in pop culture. You know, this isn't some, you know, conspiracy that all these actors are involved in. This is probably satanic uh, inspiration of some sort. That's why the one eye is so prevalent in our pop culture. And of course, the Prophet says that he said that the Antichrist is awa, is one eyed. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is Surah uh, An'am, Surah number 6, 121. <laughs> That indeed the demons uh, inspire their minions uh, to uh, dispute with you. Right? So same verb is used. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uh, will use this verb awha in the Quran when inspiring non-prophetic people, non-prophetic human beings, so people that aren't prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah uh, uh, 111, That remember when I inspired the disciples of Isa alayhi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave wahi to the disciples of Isa alayhi but these are non-prophets. Why are they non-prophets? Because the Prophet says in a hadith that is rigorously authenticated in Bukhari about Isa alayhi he said, Laysa bayni wa baynahu nabiyun. There is not between uh, me and him a prophet. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this verb, awha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, uh, about the mother of Musa alayhi in Surah Al-Qasas, ayah number 7. ila ummi Musa an And we inspired, or we revealed to the mother of Moses to nurse him, to nurse Musa alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Awha, to the mother of Musa. And she's called Ummu Musa, the only woman named in the Quran is Maryam alayhi salam. But according to the Torah, her name is Yahoved, well, Allahu alam. Uh, and there's an opinion um, that she's actually a prophet, right? There's a minority opinion, but it's an opinion that Imam Al-Qurtubi, Ibn Hazm, that there are female prophets and she's a mother. <coughs> now, technically, fil istilah, what is wahi? The ulama say, the technical definition of wahi is kalamullah al munazzalu Kalamullah al munazzalu So the sent down, literally, sent down speech of God, the speech of God which has been sent down, ala nabiyyin min anbiya'ihi, upon a prophet from his prophets, upon a prophet. The speech of God which is sent down upon a prophet. This is the technical definition of wahi. We say theological definition of wahi. However, the ulama, they do make a, dis a distinction between wahi, wahyun, which is revelation given to prophets, and iha'un. There's another word called iha. So, alif, ya, ha, alif, hamza. Iha. And iha is non prophetic revelation. So in the Quran, for example, and both of these concepts, both of these are uh, infinitives, both of these infinitives are denoted in the Quran by the verb awha, 
So they share a verb, but they're different concepts. Right? So when we read the word wahyun, right, uh, it is referring to prophets, prophetic revelation. Wahy is only for prophets. Iha'un is for non-prophets. Um, another word for iha is ilham. Ilham. And we'll talk about uh, ilham. Uh, but again, both of these concepts are denoted by the verb awha in the Quran. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, going back to that ayah in Al-Ma'idah, وَإِذْ أَوْحَيْتُ إِلَى الْحَوَارِيِّينَ that we inspired or revealed to the prophets, this is uh, to the uh, disciples, this is iha'un, or ilham, this is not prophetic revelation, this is not wahi. The ulama say, wahi is only for prophets, this term wahi. <coughs> the ulama also mentioned that prophetic wahi, so revelation given to a prophet, may be religious and theological in nature or not. Right? There may be some element of uh, some sort of worldly affair that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to reveal to a prophet. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, fulka bi a'yunina wa wahyina to Nuh alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, build the ark under our eyes, which means under our protection, and under our inspiration, under our wahi. So Nuh salam was given wahi as to how to build a good ship, right? Because he didn't know how to build a ship. The ulama also mentioned that Dawud salam was given wahi as to how to make uh, uh, armor or chain mail. And other prophets were given wahi uh, with respect to things like medical science or mathematics. Allahu Akbar. Now, um, the ulama also say that there's three types of wahi. There's three types of wahi. Again, when I say wahi, I'm talking about revelation given to prophets. Okay? Prophetic revelation. Broadly speaking, three types. The first type is called internal perception. Internal, or you can say interior, interior perception. This is when meanings... Meanings, ma'ani, meanings are perceived in the heart of a prophet. Okay? No voice is heard. And then the prophet, him or herself, will choose the words to articulate that meaning. So there's no literal dictation here. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the Prophet to marry a certain woman. Right? So he'll have meanings descended to his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But no, no kalimat, there's no words. So when he awakes from his sleep, he knows the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is giving him this type of wahi, internal perception. And this is done either with an angelic medium or without. Either through Jibreel alayhi salam or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place meanings, ma'ani, directly into the heart of the Prophet sallallahu himself. Internal perception. Interior perception. The second type of wahi is called interior locution. Interior locution. This is internal auditory dictation. So, and this is also with an angelic mediation. So the angel, Jibreel will come to the Prophet and he'll give words to the Prophet The Prophet will hear them internally, the words of the angel. And these are specific words. They're not just meanings. They're actual words. And the Prophet will remember these words and then recite them. This is called interior locution through angelic mediation. Interior locution through angelic mediation. Again, this is when the Prophet is when Jibreel comes to the Prophet and gives him an internal auditory dictation. So the Prophet hears actual words internally. And when he uh, comes out of his state of receiving the revelation, he will repeat the words. And then scribes would eventually write them down and it becomes Quran. 
Now, another type of interior locution is without an angelic mediation. Without an angelic mediation. And this is the, the highest, most exalted type of wahi. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives words, actual words, to the Prophet sallallahu without an angel. And uh, the ulama say that this happened a, a couple of times. The most famous is when the Prophet Sallallahu was at the base of the Arsh beyond the Sidratul Muntaha on the night of Laylatul Isra and Mi'raj where Jibril Alayhi Salam did not pass. So he's in, beyond the seventh heaven at the base of the throne. Jibril Alayhi Salam could not pass. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى I inspired my servant whatever I inspired without an angelic mediation. So Allah gave him words. What are these words? Ibn Mas'ud mentions Khawatim al-Baqarah, the end of Surah al-Baqarah. The last two ayahs of Surah al-Baqarah, Aman al-Rasul. This contains the essential aqidah of the Muslims. Right? These two ayat were placed directly into the heart of the Prophet Wasallam without Jibril Wasallam. This is called interior locution without angelic mediation. Another word for it is mosaic theophany. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would speak to Musa alayhi salam. So any type of mediation. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا There's something very special. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Nisa, Ayah 164. There's something very, very special about how Allah spoke to Musa. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Taklima is a infinitive maf'ul mutlaq, which is stressing the verb. Very special way, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also spoke in that way to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam on some occasions. And there's other occasions as well we'll talk about. Okay, so again, interior perception, going back to the first kind of wahi, interior perception, the, the Prophet is not receiving kalimat, He's not receiving words. He's just receiving ma'ani, meanings. Right? Meanings. I need to do this, I need to do that. This is what Allah is inspiring me to do. Right? And then he will articulate to his sahaba what he needs to do, what Allah is commanding him to do. So this is not Quran, this is hadith. Right? But interior locution, with or without angelic mediation, is when he's actually receiving kalimat. Allah is giving him words, actual words. Right? And the Prophet وسلم, will repeat those words, and Allah is ordering him, Jibreel is ordering him to recite these words in prayer. And this is the Quran. The third type of wahi is exterior locution. So we have interior perception, interior locution. Now we have exterior locution. And this is always through an angelic mediation. It's always through an angel. This is when an angel comes to the Prophet So this is exterior auditory dictation. An angel comes in the form of a human being to the Prophet and says, Quote, say this, and the Prophet repeats. Right? Oftentimes the angel would come um, in a form that was seen by other people. Sometimes the angel was not seen by other people. We'll talk more about this in Shalom. Uh, sometimes the angel would come to the Prophet in his actual form, on rare occasion. In his actual form. There's a verse in the Quran, Surah 42, verse 51. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشِرٍ أَيُكَلِمَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا وَحْيًا It is not befitting for a human being that Allah should speak to him except by Wahi, and the ulama say here, the meaning is interior perception, the first type. Aw, or min warai hijab, or from behind a veil. And the ulama say this is interior locution. God is veiled, right? God is veiled, but there's no mediation. Aw, yursila rasulan fa yuhiya bi idnihi mayyasha. Again, chapter 42, verse 51. The first part of the ayah is talking about interior perception. The middle part of the ayah is talking about interior locution. 
in the last part of the ayah, or we send to him a messenger, meaning angel, who inspires him by his permission, whatever he wills, exterior locution. Any questions on these three types of wahi? The latter two are Quran. The first one is hadith. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Can you just repeat the ayah? Yes, verse 42, verse 51. 4251. So that's a shura, verse 51. Yes, sir. Are there any more examples of second type of Pirdana locution without an angel? Yeah, we'll talk about that, fellow. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. I just had a question. Uh, would interior locution with angelic mediation and exterior locu locution, what is the difference between those? Exterior locution is when uh, an angel would come okay. in human form. So the Prophet oh, okay. would hear with his ears. Right? It's external auditory dictation. Like in the cave. Iqra. Ma'ana biqari. It's external locution. Right? We'll talk more about this in a minute here. So... These methods of wahi are indicated in the hadith. It's hadith in Bukhari, Kitab al-Wahi. The first book of, of Bukhari is called Kitab al-Wahi. There's 97 abwal in Bukhari. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ahyanan ya'atini, he's talking about the wahi. Ahyanan, ahyanan ya'atini, mithlu salsalat al-jaras, wa huwa ashadduhu alayya, fa yafsimu anni wa qad wa'itu ma qal, wa ahyanan, so he says, sometimes the revelation comes to me like the ringing of a bell. Like the ringing of a bell. And that's the most severe on me physically. Until it abates when I understand what it is saying. And sometimes it comes to me, sometimes the revelation comes to me in the form of an angel taking the form of a man. So the first part of the hadith is interior Right? Locution. The second part of the hadith, an angel comes exterior locution. So what is this ringing of bells? So there's actually, according to Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, there's 46 ways in which the Prophet Sallallahu received the wahi. 46 different ways. One of them is the ringing of bells. <clears throat> Some of the ulama say this means, this is how he described it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in reality, it was the fluttering of the angel's wings. This is an opinion from the Ulama. Ibn Arabi says it was continuous. It was coming from all directions. But it's something he's hearing internally. Right? We'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, inshallah. And some of the Ulama say that uh, the huruf al muqatta'at, so the disjointed letters, right? Like Yasin, Hamim. That one of the practical functions of these letters was to focus the Prophet when he's receiving internal locution. So you can imagine the Prophet is very busy in his life, so Allah wants to focus him. One way of focusing him is to bring in a human being in front of him who introduces himself as an angel. And quote, say this, okay, he repeats, right? Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him these letters to focus him. Hamim. So he hears this initially. So it's, it's, it's vibrations that turn into words, and he understands that it's revelation. Now, why Hamim? Why Yasin? Allahu right? There's different theories about that. Nobody really knows. It's one of the mysteries of the Quran. There are some ulama who have ta'wil, mystical exegesis, explaining what these letters mean. But all of them say, Wallahu alam, nobody really knows. In a hadith of Aisha in Bukhari, she says, Laqad ra'aytuhu yanzilu alayhi al-wahi fi al-yawm al-shadid al-barad wa inna jabinahu liyatafassadu araqan. She said, I saw the Prophet ﷺ receive the revelation on a severely cold day and indeed his forehead was dripping with sweat. So, <clears throat> there was a, a physical manifestation. Uh, physical manifestation. There were things happening to him, uh, obviously, physically, when the revelation was descending. So he would sweat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would turn pale, sometimes begin panting. Uh, some of the 
um, Orientalist said that he was having seizures. This is um, obviously false. When someone has a seizure, they fall to the ground, they're shaking, they're foaming at the mouth, and they don't remember anything. I actually had experience with this. Not me having a seizure, but I had an elderly boss when I was working at a place called Mailboxes, etc. I think it's called the UPS store now. This is way back in like before Y2K. <laughs> And my, it was like, you know, we're closing, and my boss, she starts shaking, going into a seizure. And I actually caught her. She's about to lay on the side of the, the table and everything. So I caught her. I put her on the ground. She was shaking. She was foaming at the mouth. And then the ambulance, can't call the, the ambulance. And uh, I remember they asked her, do you know this guy? And they pointed to me, and she said, no. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, what year is it? She said, oh, I, I know this one. Can't even know the year, right? So these are not. This is not you know, epilepsy. This is, he's not having seizures. Some of them. You don't have a seizure and then you come out of it and you're reciting Surah <laughs> Rahman suddenly. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. But there were some physical things that were happening to him, right? Because the weight of the wahi, right? Inna sanulti alayka qawlan taqila. Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the Quran that this speech is very weighty. Right? And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, You know, he had some gray hair, not a lot of gray hair, not like me, a lot of gray hair, but it was a chemical imbalance. Uh, but because his constitution was so perfect, physically, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, at 60 years old, he looked like he was in his 30s. But he had a little, in his 60s, he had a little bit of gray hair here on the temples. And Ibn Umar says 11 or 18 hairs. But he said, I got these gray hairs from the weightiness of the revelation of Surah Hud, Surah Hud, which talks about the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroying these city-states that disobeyed him, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very weighty for the Prophet sallallahu and other, he said, wa akhawatuha, and other, like his, his sister surahs, others that describe the, the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he would receive the revelation, if he was sitting on a conveyance, the conveyance would kneel. He was sitting on his camel, the camel would kneel. Uh, one time, Abu Bakr said that um, he was sitting next to the Prophet وسلم, and the wahi descended upon the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr's leg was under the Prophet's leg. And he said that, I thought my leg was going to be crushed under his leg. And Zayd said something similar as well. In the hadith of Ahmad, uh, he said, it feels like my soul being extracted. Sayyidina Umar said he heard the humming of bees coming from his face when the Prophet was receiving revelation. So the Umar, he, he was very close to the Prophet when the Wahi descended and he heard, he said it sounded like bees humming. And, and Sayyidina Umar is special. I mean, he, he's, uh, he has a, he's very, he's very prophetically attuned, Sayyidina Umar. That's why the Prophet وسلم, said in a sound hadith in Tirmidhi, if there was a Prophet after me, it would have been Sayyidina Umar. In fact, on one occasion, and some say two occasions, the Prophet وسلم, is receiving wahi, uh, Surah Al-Mu'minun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the creation of the human being. And the Prophet وسلم, is repeating this. Before the Prophet can get to the end of the ayah, Sayyidina Umar would finish it. The first time it's revealed, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ And the Prophet said, yes, that's the end of it. This is how in tune Sayyidina Umar is with the, with the wahi. <clears throat> so you have the ringing of bells. Another method or another way would come to the Prophet It is an angel coming as a human being. We talked about this, this form of exterior locution. Sometimes the angel would take the form of a companion named Dihya al-Kalbi. And this has been the object of much you know, ridicule by you know, Orientalists and anti-Muslim polemicists. You know, they say, well, this guy was obviously pretending to be an angel. But why Dihya al-Kalbi? It's because Dihya was extremely beautiful. Extremely beautiful companion. And other forms as well. If you look at the, uh, the hadith of Jibril uh, this, uh, Sayyidina Umar said, وَلَا يَعْرِفُهُ مِنَّا أَحَدٌ Jibril alayhi salam came into a form of a human being. We did, no one, none of us knew who he was. He was an unknown to, to any of us. <coughs> the dominant opinion is that uh, the angel that brought the wahi to the Prophet ﷺ was always Jibreel ﷺ. And 
That's the dominant opinion. Based on the ayah of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah 97, 297. قُلْ مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوًا لِجِبْرِيلَ فَإِنَّهُ نَزَّلُهُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Say, whoever is an enemy to Gabriel, for indeed he brings the revelation, uh, or brings the revelation to your heart by the permission of God. Some scholars also say that during the Fatra, so there was a, a span of time in which the Prophet ﷺ did not receive the revelation. Right? Uh, some say it's 15 days, some say up to six months. Right? Allahu alam, the exact length of time. Uh, some say up to three years. The ulama say during this time, Israfil would come and visit the Prophet. And Ibn Hajar says that he would give the Prophet wahi, but non Quranic wahi. Just for consolation, just to give him you know, peace of mind, just to reassure him that everything is okay. That Israfil would visit the Prophet. <clears throat> the Prophet said that this method of exterior locution, wahua ahwanuhu alayya, this is the most this is the easiest for me. So when it's exterior locution, it would be easy for the Prophet <laughs> physically. But when it's interior, it would it would be tough on him physically, especially certain suwar of the Quran that's describing the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the only things that, you know, that um, um, considerably you know, aged him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Otherwise, he's in perfect physical appearance. <clears throat> and it's part of our aqidah to believe that he's the most beautiful of human beings, even more so than Yusuf alayhi wa <clears throat> Now, uh, as we said, Ibn Hajar said, there's 46 methods of the wahi. So we mentioned ringing of bells, an angel coming as a human being. Um, another one uh, is an angel in original appearance. So this happened again two or three times where Jibreel salam, would give the Prophet salam, wahi in the form in which Allah created Jibreel salam. So the most, one of the most famous is, you know, the very beginning of, uh, towards the beginning of the, uh, <coughs> right after the bi'atha, the commissioning of the Prophet Sallallahu came to the Prophet Sallallahu in his true form and gave him wahi. And again, during the mi'raj, during the mi'raj, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala manifested Jibreel Alayhi Salaam in his true form. Another method, the fourth one, true dreams. Arubya as-sadiqa. The Prophet said that when he said a true dream is one forty-sixth of nabuwa. Right? A true dream is one forty-sixth of nabuwa because there's forty-six ways in which prophets receive wahi. One of them is arubya sadiqa. The believer has arubya sadiqa. It's not prophecy. It could be ilham. Ilham or Iha, as we said before. But we don't use the term Wahi unless we're talking about a prophet. And the truest of dreams are at Suhoor time. Astaqarrubiya bil ashar, just before Fajr. The truest of dreams, according to the Prophet. They heard him say because that's when the Prophet was born during this time. And you should, if you have a good dream, you should write it down, because you'll forget. Write it down immediately, and have it interpreted. There's a science of dream interpretation. <clears throat> okay. So a true dream. And he would have dreams, true dreams, before and after the bi'atha. The bi'atha is his commissioning as a prophet. On Laylatul Qadr, when he was 40 years old, right? On Jabal al Nur, the episode of Iqra, right? That's that's when he was commissioned as a prophet. But even in his thirties, or even earlier, he would have true dreams, which is an indication that he's already a prophet before age forty, just not commissioned as a prophet. And in the sound hadith, when did you become a prophet? When Adam was Bain al Ruh like Jasad. When did you become a prophet? 
When Adam was between soul and body, I was a prophet. <clears throat> okay. And of course, there's miracles attributed to him, even as a child. These are called irhas, irhas, you know, pre-prophetic or pre-bi'atha miracles. Like the story of Bahira, the monk, when the Prophet ﷺ was with the caravan and Bahira noticed that trees were bending to shade him, right? A pre-prophetic miracle. Um, so the dream of a prophet is always true. The dream of a prophet is always true and it's always wahi. For the rest of us, a dream can be one of four things. A dream can be from the nafs. It's called nafsani or egotistic dream, right? So, you know, if you if you read some something haram or see something haram before you go to sleep, you probably see it in your dream. This is from the nafs. If you go to sleep very very hungry, you probably see some food. If you're very thirsty. You'll be in a waterfall. You go swimming. Right? This is from the nafs. Uh, then you have something called um, an angelic dream, or uh, malakani, coming from an angelic presence. And you have shaitani, right? Something coming from a demonic presence. That's why when you go to sleep, you should sleep with wudu. You should sleep on your right side. And there's certain adiria, prophetic invocations of the Prophet They're very, very short. Uh, if you want to be more ambitious, recite Ayatul Kursi, uh, recite Qul Wallahu Ahad three times. Just while you're falling asleep, recite and fall asleep in that state. And inshallah, have a, and have a good intention. Have an, make an intention uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you a ru'ya of the Prophet sallallahu in your sleep. <coughs> And then there's uh, divine Rabbani dreams. Rabbani. Like if a believer sees the Prophet وسلم, this is Rabbani. Right? This is a, is a true dream. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a gift to a believer. Right? Shaitan cannot imitate the Prophet وسلم. There's even an opinion that Shaitan cannot imitate any Prophet. So any Prophet you see. Um, <coughs> Some of the ulama even say, if you see someone that doesn't look like the Prophet but introduces himself as the Prophet, and you have a strong inclination that it is the Prophet, then it's him. He's trying to tell you something. Like one of my teachers, he saw the Prophet uh, with a long white beard. I mean, he didn't have a long white beard. One of my teachers saw him with no beard. Right? And he was disturbed when he woke up. He said, man. You know, he didn't have his, his sunnah, where was the beard? So he got it interpreted and he said, the Prophet is trying to tell you to follow sunnah because a believer is the mirror of a believer. He's reflecting a fault in you. He wants you to see it on him. Because the mirror never, you never get mad at a mirror. It just reflects the truth. It never insults you. It tells you the truth. Right? If it's straight and it's clean, it'll tell you the truth. Right? So the Prophet وسلم, is trying to give you a message be in the light of Allah. But the dominant opinion here again is that no, um, he, if it doesn't look like him, it's not him. It has to look like him. <clears throat> okay. Um, so true dreams. And Aisha said, "Awwalu ma budiya bihi Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam al wahi al ruya saliha fi nomi fakan la yara ruya illa jaat." She said that the first type of wahi that came to the Prophet ﷺ was true dreams in his sleep. And then she said that he never saw a dream except that it, uh, except that it came like the break of day. In other words, it always came true. And you can count on his dream coming true as much as you can count on the sun rising in the morning. His dreams would always come true. It was a dream that informed him of what Labid. Labid was a Jewish mage. A mage is a uh, practitioner of black magic, called a mage. So the Prophet ﷺ had a, a dream, Finnaum, in his sleep, of what Labid had done to him, and also Allah inspired him, gave him wahi, 
as to how to deal with breaking uh, what he had done to him. And this was obviously after the Beratha. And this story is controversial as well. There's not a lot of strong hadith support for the story. It's mentioned in Sirah literature. But it, it seems to come into conflict with Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, that Allah gives you ismas protected you from the people. So there seems to be some problems with the story. <coughs> but apparently, uh, this mage had gotten some of the hair of the Prophet. And the Quran does talk about those who blow on knots, right? The last two surahs of the Quran are called Al Mu'awid, Al Mu'awid the Tain, right? Um, and these, I, these two surahs were revealed on the occasion of this, of this episode, according to the Asbab al Nuzul literature. He got some of the hair of the Prophet and he tied seven knots into it and he threw it into a well. And the Prophet said, after blowing some incantations upon the hair or upon the knots, something that is mentioned in his, in his, in this, whatever this text was that he was using, this mage. And so the Prophet said, he noticed that you know, his, his memory was failing. It played with his memory a little bit. And then he told Sayyidina Ali to stand over the well and recite the last two surahs of the Quran. Surah Al Falak wa Nas, and there's um, uh, there's seven ayat. No, there's eleven ayat. Sorry, eleven knots, eleven knots in the air. And there's eleven ayat in these last two surah. And eleven sort of a it's sort of a, a a sacred number for the practitioners of black magic. So we use the number to sort of counter that. Right? So we do things 11, you know, 33, that's to counter the evil, the satanic evil. And we use it for a different way. So numbers are like a sword. Uh, you can use a, or a knife, I should say. You can use a knife to pair an orange or you can to kill someone. Numbers are the same type of thing. So some of the Arunama, they caution against getting into gematria, which is like the science of numbers, using numbers to do things to people. <coughs> anyway. Okay, and then we have direct discourse. We talked about this. So what is direct discourse? This is interior locution without an angelic mediation. And the brother asked about, are there other instances in which the Prophet ﷺ was given karimat by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without Jibreel alayhi salam? We mentioned one, Khawatum uh, al-Baqarah. Imam al mentions Surah 93 and 94 also were given by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet <laughs> without an angelic mediation. And then the one that comes after, And these were given to him by Allah when he was asleep. Imam al mentions. And these two surahs are always recited uh, together. Ibn Mas'ud would always recite these two surahs together. <clears throat> <coughs> the Prophet sallallahu he said, "Inna inna ro ruh al qudusi, inna ruh al qudusi nafafa fi roi." Indeed, the spirit of sanctification inspires my thinking. So here he's talking about interior perception, inspiration in the heart uh, with a medium interior perception. So these are, again, ma'ani. Indeed, the spirit of sanctification, most of the Urma say, Jibreel alayhi salam, inspires my thinking. His thoughts, right, are a result of the wahi he's receiving. His, even his thinking process is wahi. Eventually, everything he says is wahi. Wa ma yantiku anil hawa in huwa illa Everything he says is why. <clears throat> now let's talk about the types of iha un. Iha, or we said, um, uh, iha is non prophetic revelation. Non prophetic revelation. <coughs> the first type is called kashf, kashf, kashfun. This translated as some sort of Disclosure or unveiling, right? Mukashafa, the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation is called Mukashafa. 
So the ulama say that kashf relates to something, relates to sensory abilities, something directly visible, right? Um, for example, Sayyidina Umar one time was giving a khutbah, and uh, in the middle of the khutbah he said, Ya Sariya al-Jabal, Ya Sariya al-Jabal. And everyone kind of looked around. Who's Sariya? Well, Sariya's not here. And then the, the tradition says Sayyidina Ali was laughing, because Sayyidina Ali knew what's happening. So they asked him after, and he said, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me a vision of the army I had sent towards Persia. The leader of the army was a man named Sariya. And I was warning him that on the other side of the mountain, there was people waiting to ambush them. Right? So this is kashf. This is a type of unveiling. Right? Something that's related to sensory abilities. Something you can prove by a discovery of some sort. So this, these are given to saints and righteous people. Right? An example from the life of the Prophet ﷺ is one day he walked out and his camel was gone. Uh, so a Jewish man passed by and he said, look, look at your Prophet. He doesn't know where his camel is. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, I only know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tells me. And then at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately told him, he said, ask for my camel, it's in such and such place, and it's, it's next to this tree, and he described it perfectly. So, kashf, and then the second type of iha is called ilham. Ilham. Fa'alhamaha fujuruha, fujuraha wa taqwaha, qad aflaha man zakaha, qad khaba man dassaha. Ilham. Ilham uh, is intuitive knowledge, intuitive ilm which is infused upon the heart. Right? But Khidr alayhi salam, Allah says, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمًا So ilm al-laduni, ilm al-laduni is a type of ilham, knowledge that's given to a non-prophet. That's true knowledge. True knowledge. So the ulama say that, that ilham is higher than kashf. Is it closer to the station of a prophet? Ilham. Ilham is a type of ma'rifa that's given to a saint. Ma'rifa is gnosis of God, true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's given to someone as a gift without reading books. Allah infuses it upon the heart of a wali. Right? Some of the other stories of the awliya. There are some awliya that were known to never study books, but they teach classes. They asked them, when, when did you study? In my sleep. In my sleep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me shah, opens my heart, gives me knowledge. This is possible, mungkin. <clears throat> okay. Imam al he said, this is according to Imam al-Sha'arani, his tabaqat al-Kubra. Imam al he said, if your unveiling, if your kashf contradicts the Qur'an and Sunnah, then hold fast to the Qur'an and Sunnah and ignore your unveiling. Or if somebody else's unveiling contradicts the Qur'an and Sunnah. Why do you say that? Because there are, there are ways in which kuffar um, seem to replicate kashf. It's called shamanism, right? Calling on jinn, for example. Jinn can give you information. There are secret societies whose goal is to uh, you know, domesticate, if you will, jinn, to bring them things, do favors for them. They have certain passwords that they use. This is real. These are educated people. These are people in our government that have these meetings on how to control jinn. This is absolutely true. So we have to be careful about, about that. Uh, Imam al-Jilani, he said, if you see a man flying through the air or walking on water, la tusaddiqubi, don't believe in him, unless you check his istiqama to the kitab and the sunnah. And don't believe in someone who can do some sort of, and these are khawarik al-adat, these are breaks of natural law. Even breaking natural law 
So don't believe in him unless you see that he has istiqamah, uprightness in the Quran and the Sunnah. But if he's lacking there, be aware, because there's ihana, there's istidraj, you know, there's, there's different types of miracles that are given to false prophets. Istidraj is, you know, an apparent miracle. You know, so, you know, something that you can learn if you really wanted to. <laughs> but why would you? For example, you know, Buddhist monks that can stop their heartbeat. And you learn how to do this through meditation. 30 years, a waste of time. But you think, well, it's a miracle. Or you can, there are these, you know, these people that you stab them with a sword, they can move their organs around and evade the sword. And you think, well, that's a miracle. It's not. You can actually learn how to do that. But it takes like 30 years. Well, why do you want to do that? It's a waste of time. <laughs> so it's called istidraj. You think, well, it's a miracle. It's really not. There's no tofik in something like Who cares? Right? <coughs> Okay, we have a few minutes here. So, like we said, at some point, all of the Prophet's speech became wahi. And the textual proofs, as we mentioned, Surah Al Najm, 1 through 5. Wa ma yantiku anil hawa. Ma yantiku, ma is negating, yantiku is a fi'l mudarir, is an imperfect tense. When ma negates a mudarir, it means never. He never speaks from Hawa. Hawa means from himself, from his own caprice, his own desires. Right? Everything he says is wahi. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah 59, ayah number 7. وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ Whatever the messenger gives you, take it. Whatever he gives you. Ma means whatever. Here it's not negating. Right? Here is relative math. Whatever he gives you, take it, because it's good. Many times in the Quran, obey Allah, atir Allah, atir Rasul, ba'alakum turhamun. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. Obeying Allah means obey the Quran. Obey the Messenger means obey what the Prophet is saying. Obey his words, because it's also wahi. In the Quran, 1644. We sent down upon you the dhikr, the Quran, in order for you to make tabiyin, bayan, in order for you to explain what was revealed to them. The Quran was sent down in order for you to explain the Quran to them. That means that the Prophet is the first and foremost mufassir of the Quran. The explainer of the Quran, the commentator of the Quran. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ And concerning the ni'mah of your Lord, and almost all of the Rabbana say the ni'mah here is the revelation. Concerning the revelation of your Lord, فَحَدِّثْ Give some hadith. Right? So we follow hadith. We follow sunnah. There's a difference between sunnah and hadith. A hadith is a statement or action that is attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. Whether it's true or false, something attributed to him is called a hadith. But sunnah means the authenticated hadith. The sunnah is the normative practice of the Prophet ﷺ, which is derived from sound hadith. Right? So there's some hadith that are forged. There's no doubt about it. And we reject those hadith, but we accept sunnah. We have to accept sunnah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of God a beautiful sunnah, a beautiful example. <coughs> Whatever he gives you, take it. Whatever he gives you. We revealed this dhikr in order for you to explain it. Okay. We also have an example of what's known as non-Quranic wahi. Reference in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا نَبَأَتْ بِهِ وَأَذْهَرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ عَرَّفَ بَعْضَهُ وَأَعْرَضَ عَنْ بَعْضٍ So one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu hoped to conceal something from the Prophet sallallahu Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet what was happening. 
So she told the prophet as well. And it says the prophet affirmed part of what she said and repudiated part of what she said, or rejected part of what she said. And she said to the prophet, Man an ba'aka Who told you this? Qala nabta'ani al-alim al-khabir. He told me, the one who has omniscience and the one who knows the unseen. So what was that actual thing? What was the wording which Allah told the prophet is not mentioned in the Quran? Right? So we know that the Prophet ﷺ is receiving wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is not recited in the Quran. Right? Because the specifics of what was said are not there. Also at the Mi'raj, at the Ascension, <clears throat> we reveal to the Prophet whatever we wish to reveal. So the end of Baqarah was given to the Prophet, but many other things were given to him through wahi that we don't know about. For example, Ibn Mas'ud also mentions the, the promise of Jannah for the Ummah of the Prophet Sisa. Are they praying, Isha? Yeah. Okay, we have to stop. <laughs>